Good morning and welcome everyone to the 12th meeting of the Culture, Tourism, Europe and External Affairs Committee and our third remote meeting. Our main item of business this morning is an evidence session on the future relationships negotiations between the European Union and the UK Government. And we have David McAllister, MEP, with us. David is speaking to the committee, committee today in his role as Chair of the UK Coordination Group in the European Parliament. David, it's a pleasure to welcome you to the meeting today, albeit remotely, and I do hope that you will be, we will be able to welcome you in person to the Scottish Parliament very soon. In a moment, I will invite Mr McAllister to make an opening statement, uh, but I just want to go through some technical issues first because of the challenges of managing a virtual meeting such as this, we are going to take questions in a pre-arranged order. Once Mr McAllister has made his opening remarks, I will invite members to ask questions. I will then invite David to respond and go back to each in turn, and each member has one follow-up question. Once completed, I will invite the next questioner and so on. I would be grateful if questions and answers could be kept succinct. Uh, finally, I would remind members to give broadcasting staff a few seconds to operate their microphone before beginning to ask your question or provide an answer. And I'd now like to invite Mr McAllister to make an opening statement of around five minutes. Mr McAllister. Thank you so much for inviting me and warm welcome here from Brussels. And it's a great honour to address your committee. Uh, I will kick off with a five-minute introduction where we stand uh, with regard to the ongoing negotiations. Um, as the Honourable Convener mentioned, I chair the UK Coordination Group in the European Parliament, which has replaced the Brexit Steering Group, which was, as you might remember, led by Giefer Hofstadt, the Belgian Liberal MEP. Perhaps I'll begin with outlining how different these negotiations are from any other trade negotiations the EU has ever held. Due to the unprecedented level of interconnectedness, the geographic proximity and the already tight alignment of the, EU, the UK with EU regulatory standards. So in order to address in the best possible way the interests of the citizens in the EU, and also in the UK, the European Union has adopted a negotiating framework that envisages a strong and comprehensive partnership between both sides. Now, we deliberately talk about a partnership because a partnership is more than just a mere free trade agreement. The approach here in Brussels is to take into account the wishes of the UK government to affirm clearly the British independence and sovereignty, as well as the geographical proximity and how we are interconnected between the EU and the UK after 46 years of successful UK membership in the EU. The EU has made clear from the start, the more privileges and the more rights the UK seeks, the more obligations are linked. There will be no more cherry picking. We experienced this over many, many years, and in the end, it wasn't satisfactory for both sides. Unfortunately, and I'm saying that as somebody who feels very close at heart to the UK, unfortunately, our ambition hasn't been matched by that of the UK government, at least until now. Nevertheless, I welcome the belated publication of the UK government of a series of legal texts covering quite a number of areas. I think this is an important step in transparency and accountability towards citizens. Let me be frank at the beginning because we want to have an open debate and discussion. After three rounds of negotiations, no real progress has been achieved, with the exception of very limited openings on the also limited number of areas. And this is disappointing. We had a joint Foreign Affairs and Trade Committee meeting yesterday, 
uh, per remote video conference and colleagues across all party lines echoed that they are very disappointed that progress hasn't really been made and that we are now under enormous time pressure. Since the UK government is still determined not to extend the transition period, we have three things to do until the 31st of December of this year in parallel. First of all, we need to implement the withdrawal agreement, and this is utterly important for the negotiations of the future partnership. The EU will be very vigilant regarding implementation of the withdrawal agreement, and especially the European Parliament will scrutinize this aspect of the negotiations closely. In the context of the withdrawal agreement, the protocol on Ireland, Northern Ireland remains, of course, the biggest challenge considering the technical complexity and the political sensitivity. Secondly, we have to prepare our businesses and citizens on both sides for those changes that will take place on the 1st of January 2021, if we have an agreement or if we don't have an agreement. And the third thing we have to do is a future agreement. We still believe that it's wise to negotiate a comprehensive economic and security partnership with an overall governance framework as agreed by the EU and the UK in the political declaration of the 17th of October last year. There are four fields, as you well know, where we are still at odds. The level playing field, fisheries, cooperation on justice and police issues, and finally, the overall governance. The next negotiating round will start on the 1st of June. We will be debriefed by Michel Barnier after the last day of the negotiating round on the 4th of June. And I think after this negotiating round, both sides will have to analyze if it makes sense to hold the high-level conference as planned in June, and what this high-level conference will be about, because it was planned that the high-level conference would take stock of where we are after a few months of negotiations. And this high-level conference, if it takes place, should also indicate where our priorities lie in the second half. So in the moment, it's a rather pessimistic mode here in Brussels. Not only the Commission, but also the Member States and the European Parliament share the analysis that there's a considerable lack of tangible progress on the main, main issues. We are in enormous time pressure. We understand that the UK government is not willing to ask for an extension of the transition period, but this now really means the clock is ticking. It's ticking very fast, and we need to make progress very soon. Once again, thank you for inviting me, and it's a real honor for me as a son of somebody who came from Glasgow to Germany in the 1950s to talk to the representatives of the parliament of his home country. And I'm still the proud holder of a British passport, and I love visiting Scotland, and I've been to your parliament many times, and I would like to really underline the good work all of you are doing. I follow Scottish politics as good as I can from Brussels, uh, and I'm hoping to ask uh, to answer many of your questions. Thank you very much, David. It's a great honour to have you um, giving evidence to our committee, and uh, we very much appreciate um, that you have been a good friend to the Scottish Parliament and to our committee, and we have spoken to you in both Brussels and in Scotland before, and it's, uh, it's been a very, very productive relationship. So we hope that that will continue uh, in person in the future. And thank you for those very comprehensive uh, opening uh, remarks about where we are. Um, I, I, as you know, um, following the publication of the draft text, there was an exchange of letter letters between Michael Barney and David Frost, the UK negotiator, and they didn't 
suggest much agreement uh, at all. Um, a letter from David Frost um, uh, was re was badly received by Mikael Barnier. He underlined the EU's refusal to allow cherry picking um, from past agreements and emphasised that the UK had no automatic entitlement to any benefits that the EU had offered or granted in other contexts. I, given that really terse exchange of letters, what is achievable given the time scale that we're looking at? Um, and were there any, was there anything in the, the draft legal text from the UK that surprised you? For example, I noticed that there was no mention of the European Court of Justice in any of those 12 draft texts. Well, first of all, the two letters. Um, they were, like in Edinburgh and throughout Scotland, read with large interest here in Brussels. Perhaps this exchange of letters had to be, I think it kind of shows the degree of disappointment and dissatisfaction on both sides. Um, personally, I, I believe the tone was, I'm trying to be diplomatic, it was, it was, it was a quite harsh tone. Uh, coming from the British side, and uh, but look, these two letters have been sent; they've been published, so we all know where we are. And I would say we've now exchanged letters, and now we have to get back to the negotiating table uh, because sending letters back and forth won't help us to move forward. It's very unfortunate that these negotiations cannot take place in person. Uh, video conferences, as we are all experiencing in these weeks, is the second best option. But when it comes to very sensitive issues, politically sensitive issues, what you don't have at the moment is that the chief negotiators could confidentially talk to each other behind closed doors, four, six, eight, ten, twelve eyes. This option isn't possible in the moment, and this is an additional difficult uh, uh, point. We are way behind a time scale, time frame which would have been ambitious anyhow. We should have now been preparing for the fifth round. Instead, we just had the third round, and. I can't tell you, by all means, I can't tell you what's going to happen in June. I think both sides now know that it is very, very serious. And let me just try to make clear the current schedule and the pressing time is the result of the UK's choice. I have been told that. We shouldn't request an extension of the transition period as Europeans. I understand that. It's totally up to the UK. I think it's an open secret that if the UK were to ask for an extension, I don't think the EU would say no. But we have to accept it takes two to tango. But since your country is going through the biggest challenge since the Second World War, like all other countries in Europe, I think there would be understanding here in Brussels if we could take a little longer. The second point is that David Frost said that he would like to negotiate tariff per tariff, tariff line per tariff line. This, of course, would mean that we have absolutely no chance of concluding a trade agreement until the end of the year. If you say A, you definitely need more time, and that is B, because this is what we do in normal uh, trade negotiations with third countries, and they, as you know, take five, six, seven, eight um, years. What I find unfair is that in certain parts of the British media, 
the UK, the EU's position in these negotiations is described as being ideological or dogmatic. And let me say that as a very pragmatic German Christian Democrat from the political centre, our line is not about dogmatism or ideology. It's about establishing conditions for an ambition and balanced partnership with the UK, having regained its total sovereignty, whatever that means, and we know that this was so important for some in the UK, but also taking into account our geographic proximity and importance of our trade. You cannot compare the UK with Canada or South Korea. There's a big, big difference because the UK is in our immediate neighbourhood and the, the single market, the world's largest single market, is the most important trading partner for the UK. So our objective is to ensure open and fair competition to benefit businesses and companies on both sides. We are making, we are offering the UK something which is unprecedented for a third country that is not a member of a single, country, a single market, access, no quotas, no tariffs. But of course this comes at a price, and the price is that we don't start a race to the bottom when it comes to our standards, environmental standards, consumer protection, um, state subsidies, uh, and others. And finally, I would like to repeat what I said yesterday in the Foreign Affairs Committee. Our efforts and engagement to negotiate an agreement have always been based on the political declaration. And the political declaration was signed by both sides in October. This is not an EU invention. It has the signature of the UK Prime Minister. And the second is that we will not strive for an agreement to be done at all costs. We're making an offer, and it's up to the UK to decide if they want to accept this offer or not. But if we are so at odds in the very vital issues, then we need to, and this has been a question for the UK Prime Minister and the 27 heads of government, we will then have to think how we can continue our negotiations in the second half. But still in the moment, I will remain an optimist until the last minute. I still do hope that both sides know how important an ambitious and balanced partnership for both sides would be to be concluded before the end of this year. Thank you very much for that, uh, David. So what you're saying, obviously, is that it's a bleak, a bleak picture, and it, it almost sounds as if if the agreement can't be reached, then we could see an end to negotiations uh, in in June uh, if the UK doesn't ask for uh, an an extension, which it's legally not allowed to do. Um, one of the submissions to a committee from Professor Christopher Gray at the Royal Hallway says that his view is that an extension to the transition period is vital, um, but it need not necessarily take the form of a UK request. He says the withdrawal agreement would allow it to be agreed by the Joint Committee without publicly having to be initiated by either side. Um, is that the kind of political fudge that um, might allow the UK government? Uh, to 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 get an extension to the period, um, or is there another creative way that we can get an extension that isn't uh, too humiliating for the UK government? And given the situation that we're in uh, with COVID nineteen, um, most people would consider it reasonable. Well, it's been agreed that once an extension of the transition period can be agreed for either one year or two year, and that this decision would have to be taken in the Joint Committee. Since I believe it's a sensible thing to extend the transition period, but I would never ask in a public debate the UK to decide to follow my advice. It's just, I personally, I think, would be a sensible thing to do. 
I think that there would be ways and means to make sure that the transition period can be extended and for the sake of the matter, I think the EU would be ready to take all the blame in the British media. <laughs> I think that tends to be what happens anyway, <laughs> whatever decisions exactly. made. Exactly. <laughs> it doesn't matter what we say, uh, uh, there, are, there are certain we, we love reading UK newspapers. It's just interesting that, interesting that wow, now that you've left the EU, is sometimes uh, you have the impression that they're even more interested in what we're doing here in Brussels uh, than before. <laughs> um, but look, at the beginning, Michel Barnier, Ursula von der Leyen, who I started my political career together 20 years ago, Ursula von der Leyen said, let's start these negotiations in a spirit of mutual respect and goodwill. And this is very important that the, even though we're 430 million people in the single market in the UK are 70 million, we want to have negotiations full of respect for both sides. And despite some challenges we've seen, and despite some difficulties we've had, the huge, huge majority of people responsible here in Brussels want to make the best of this difficult situation, and um, we want to have the closest partnership possible with the UK. And we fully understand that the UK has important issues, and not to use the word, but they've drawn lines of a certain colour. On the other hand, the EU is also in a not easy situation. The most important thing is for us, the integrity of the single park market needs to be protected at all times, and that the four freedoms of the single market come as a package. And if you don't accept the four freedoms, which we understand, then this, which we have to understand, and then this will have consequences. And because the integrity of the single market is so important, we're also very, very keen on following how the protocol on Ireland and Northern Ireland um, is uh, implemented, because the time to implement the protocol is short, and the practical implementation measures must start immediately so that the protocol can be operational by the 1st of January. This special status for Northern Ireland requires full implementation of the political declaration on the British side, and the more and the more effectively and the quicker the British side implements what has been agreed in the protocol, this indicates how credible and trustworthy the UK could be on other political fields where we will also need to rely on each other's goodwill. Thank you very much. And I know all our members want to dig down into various aspects of, uh, of, of those issues. Uh, I'll now invite uh, Deputy Convener Claire Baker to ask her questions. Uh, thank you, Convener. Um, the, so the withdrawal agreement set the legal basis on which the UK was leaving the EU, and the political declaration was the accompanying document that set out the the proposals and the levels of the direction, really. As you've emphasised, that was signed on the 17th of October, and since then we've had a general election in December. Um, do you feel you've, you seem to put quite a lot of faith in the political declaration? So, do you still believe it's a meaningful document to the UK government, given the political changes we've seen in the past six months or so? In the old Roman days, you would say, pacta sunt servanda. Uh, what has been agreed needs to be implemented, and um, we consider the political declaration uh, being an important a document um, important issues that are being discussed at the moment were outlined in the political 
uh, declaration. It was signed by both sides. And in international politics and in international law, uh, the change of a government doesn't change Texas, even though this political declaration may not be legally binding, it played a crucial role uh, as regards the withdrawal agreement. Um, what we find difficult is that just a few months ago, both sides agreed on important aspects and on the basis of the political declaration, Council Parliament and in the end of the Commission worked on a mandate for these negotiations and now you have this uh, piecemeal approach in London that you pick certain bits and pieces of the political declaration which are in the British interest and you leave others and say oh that's not so relevant and uh, we've had elections and there's a new majority in the House of Commons. This is once again cherry picking and this is extremely unpopular in Brussels because we've gone through this for so many decades. By the way, in your language, you pick cherries. The German translation is Wozinen pick and we pick raisins uh, in the German language, but we mean the same. So I can only once again say our efforts and engagement to negotiate an agreement have been indicated in the political declaration, and we consider the political declaration as binding. And the, yeah, Prime, Minister gave, the Prime Minister gave us his word. And is there a reason not to trust the Prime Minister? I can't imagine. And yeah, I don't disagree with any argument you put forward there, but it does increasingly appear that the UK government um, are trying to be flexible with the political declaration. They don't see it as a as a, as you say, a legal document. Um, I wanted to ask more specifically about the free trade, um, sorry, the level playing field and the different approaches that are um, to how that should be introduced. So yourself, you uh, and part of the European Parliament looked for a dynamic alignment. Uh, Barnier is talking about a non-regressive um, partnership. The UK is talking about reciprocal commitment. Do you see area for a, agreement here. The three positions um, are quite strongly put. Do you see any flexibility in being able to reach an agreement? And if we don't reach an agreement around a level playing field, what are the consequences of that? Okay, perhaps I can start with some information because you mentioned the European Parliament's position. Um, what is the European Parliament planning now to be further involved in the process. I have here, it's my lecture for tonight and tomorrow, it's a working document. The European Parliament is planning to adopt another resolution on the state of play on the EU-UK negotiations at our plenary session on the 17th or 18th of June. And the two leading committees, the Foreign Affairs Committee and the Trade Committee have appointed Rapporteurs for the Foreign Affairs Committee, it's Cathy Peary, a Dutch socialist, and in the Trade Committee, it's a Luxembourgish Christian Democrat, Christoph Hansen. And the two of them have drafted a text. And what we have done now, and this is different to the previous times when Giefer Hofstadt was chairing the Brexit steering group, we have asked all committees, if they wish, to provide opinions in form of letters or declarations. 17 out of 20 committees have contributed. So this working document now contains um, 60 pages of what the two rapporteurs have written down and then all the statements of the uh, uh, working committees. So this is now a very, very big Christmas tree. And uh, we have to work now on this working on this resolution to make out of a big Christmas tree, perhaps a smaller Christmas tree or no Christmas tree at all, because we're in the month of June. But rest assured that um, 
because you followed the wording on the level playing field, the dynamic alignment that came from the European Parliament. And this indicates that the European Parliament pays enormous attention to certain issues. Citizens' rights, environmental, consumer protection, and other standards, and on the Irish, Northern Irish issue. And the European Parliament didn't play a big role during the Brexit negotiations. There was one vote. They went through with a huge majority. But please do bear in mind that in a, in a vote on a future EU-UK partnership agreement, the European Parliament will once again have a final word. And I had the impression that this newly elected European Parliament will want to show and flex some muscles here and there. And I'm saying this as a representative of the EPP. If I look at the debates in other political groups, in the socialist group, in the liberal group, in the green group, uh, or in the uh, socialist communist GUI group, uh, you can imagine that the issues of the level playing field play an even more important role than perhaps uh, in my political family. So we have to be very, very clear that the standards we have now, by the way, standards the UK has accepted and has implemented, that they are key for any further um, cooperation with the single market. Um, so, what we followed with interest is that what Mr. Gove said a few days ago, he said that he could live with some tariffs and quotas, but this of course is inconsistent with the current timeline and the ambition declared in the political declaration. Because if you want to negotiate tariff by tariff and quota by quota, you will need a long, long time. And then the question will be for the UK government, what do you do in the meantime? Because we all hopefully still want to avoid a cliff edge on both sides on the 1st of January next year. Um, I wish I could present you this working document, but it's it's still I think it's still internal, and we really have to go through it and make it shorten the text and make it uh, better readable also for our interested interested readers in Scotland. But uh, on the 18th of June, hopefully it will be adopted, and we adopt our documents in something we call English. Uh, it's a kind of the same language that you speak in the United Kingdom. It's a very, you know, it's a very technical EU English, but you're used to these kind of papers. I think, thank you very much. We look forward to, to receiving it. I'd now like to invite Robin Mandela to ask a question to be followed by Ross Greer. Thank you, Hello. Uh, convener. Hello. Um, I, um, I, I wanted to ask you what, what you would see the purpose of an extension being. Uh, you've set out that the EU has what are in effect red lines and the UK has uh, what are, are red lines. And we've been talking for uh, now four years um, and still uh, some of those red lines exist. What, what, what do you feel would be achieved uh, by talking for longer? Well, thanks for the question. Um, the trade agreement where UK colleagues often refer to is the EU-Canada agreement, CETA, or also the EU-Japan agreement, EFTA. Both probably the most modern, far-reaching, most ambitious trade agreements we've concluded in the history of the European Union. 
And the Canada Agreement took us eight years. And the Japanese Agreement took us even longer. So the time frame was extremely ambitious anyhow. And even if we agreed on extending the transition period for the maximum time of two years, we would still only be having three years in total to negotiate something which is completely unprecedented because never ever before has the EU entangled relations with a member state, with a member of the single market and the customs union. I mean, this is terra incognita for both sides. So it would have been ambitious anyhow. But things have changed since March. We're, we're facing the largest challenge since the Second World War, the largest economic crisis since the 1930s. Um, I think many people would show some understanding if politicians in London said, look, we were so determined to leave the single market on the 31st of December, but because of the huge challenge of the pandemic and all the consequences this has, also for the ongoing negotiations, we've agreed to gain some time. And we certainly need more time. An example, it would have been helpful if the UK had published all texts for the public immediately. Um, I, I, I don't under, the, the, the EU from the first day presented a draft text, 325 pages or what. This is our proposal. Anyone can have a look at it. That's where we are. Whereas what you see on the British side is that step by step, certain texts are handed over to the Commission negotiators. However, that the Commission negotiators are not even allowed to share the UK text drafts with MEPs. From a democratic scrutiny point of view, this is hard to understand in the European Parliament because we're just as interested in reading in detail what the UK side has actually proposed. Until now, we were dependent on reports written by third people in the Commission describing, summarizing what the UK has proposed. Well, finally now, the texts have been published. I mentioned initially that that is a major step forward. Honestly, I really believe we just need more time. The delicate issue, for instance, of fisheries, where you now see after the third round that there's some movement that the UK has now presented a text which the EU can deal with and the example of fisheries, I'm pretty sure that we could find an agreement. But this time pressure, I don't believe in the moment is helpful. But anyway, I'm probably preaching to a majority of at least politicians in Scotland who are in favour of extending the transition period if I followed the debate correctly. It doesn't matter. We can do whatever we want. Our British dancing partner doesn't want to dance the tango with us. So we have to accept that there won't be an extension of the transition period. By the way, this means on the technical side that negotiations will have to be concluded in the beginning of June, uh, beginning of November. That means now we have June, July, August, September, October. We actually only have five and a half minutes to get done whatever. Okay, th thank you for that. Uh, thank you uh, for uh, that uh, answer. You're, you're not preaching to me. Um, I know that there are other politicians in Scotland who do want to see uh, an extension, but I imagine uh, you know they'd th th have views uh, on your comments. But I, I don't think that I could realistically go back to my constituents, more of whom uh, voted for Brexit than voted for me, and tell them. Uh, that we were going to wait even longer uh, to, to get fully out of the EU, especially um, if a Canada or Japan style agreement is not on offer. 
Um, I think it would be worth waiting for longer if the, there was a good deal uh, on offer from the EU. Uh, but from what you're saying, uh, those options seem to be closed off uh, to the UK. Um, but I wanted to ask, um, you've mentioned there could be movement on fishing. Um, what, what do you see that looking like? We've obviously seen press reports here in the UK, but I wonder in detail uh, what that was. Um, when it comes to fisheries, let me just see here. It says, some key disagreements remain. The UK insists on having a standalone agreement with minimal content and annual discussions on quotas and on using an EU-Norway agreement on North Sea as the most relevant model. The EU, however, highlights the long-term conservation and sustainable exploitation of stocks and considers that it can discuss quotas species by species. However, this cannot be done annually. So in fact, that is now the major point of divergence between the two sides. Uh, the UK, for understandable reasons, wants annual um, negotiations, but that uh, won't be accepted by countries like France or the Netherlands, uh, Denmark, uh, and others who have specific interests. So, but at least, Oliver Mandel, we, we're now seeing here that we have a starting point, and this is the way forward. And if I'm correctly informed, aren't both sides supposed to use all their endeavours to already find an agreement until the 1st of July? So we're even more under time pressure here. Thank you very much. I'd like to invite Ross Greer to ask a question, followed by Beatrice Wishart. Thank you, convener. Good morning, David. It's nice to see you. Um, certainly I agree with you on that point around um, extension. I think it was almost inevitable one was going to be required before the crisis that we're in. But surely in the midst of this crisis, I think uh, there would be broad understanding from the public in Scotland and across the UK on, on the need for an extension. I'd like to ask you uh, a little bit more about the points you made on the Irish protocol. Now that the UK government has accepted what was known all along, that there will need to be customs checks between Northern Ireland and Great Britain, do you believe there are still issues of uh, difference of opinion in policy, difference of opinion on what's been uh, agreed in relation to the Irish protocol, or is the issue there now purely one of implementation and a lack of time to get that implementation underway? Uh, thank you. Um, the good thing is that um, if you're the Mr. Brexit in the European Parliament, that you get so many questions, which is not so nice, but you get so many lines to take to answer or try to answer some of the questions. So uh, I was expecting all these questions. So uh, I'll just tell you what the latest is from the Vanier team on the Irish Northern Irish Protocol, they have now declared, the Commission has repeatedly underlined the importance of the UK setting out its plans with regard to all implementation measures prescribed by the Protocol on Ireland and Northern Ireland and providing a detailed timetable. The required implementation measures are set out in the Commission's technical note of the 30th of April. In that respect, the Commission welcomes the publication of the UK's paper on the implementation of the protocol, which it will now study in detail. We will share our assessment with the European Parliament and the Member States and look forward to detailed discussions with the UK at technical level. The protocol provides a stable and lasting solution to address the unique circumstances on the island of Ireland this solution avoids a hard border and protects the Belfast Agreement in all its dimensions, while also safeguarding the integrity of the EU single market. The detailed legal commitment set out in the protocol must now be implemented precisely to give full effect to this solution. The time to implement the protocol is short, and practical implementation measures must start immediately so that the protocol can be operational by the 1st of January 2021. To this end, the Commission stands ready 
to work with the British authorities. That's the official answer of the Commission. I hope that was read out perfectly. Thank you. Uh, my second question is on a quite different area um, around Erasmus. Um, a, a number of non-EU member states uh, participate in uh, Erasmus and, and, and other schemes and get huge benefit from being able to do so. Um, you'll obviously be aware that uh, education and, and issues around it are a matter for the Scottish Parliament and Scottish Government. Uh, do you believe that there would be scope for Scotland to participate in Erasmus in the way that other non-EU nations do, um, even if the, the rest of the UK were perhaps to take a, a different decision? Yes. Uh, Lukas, kannst du mal gucken, ob wir das zu Erasmus? Ja, das war in um, I'm just looking at my working document. Um, where is it? Where is it? Um, Uh, where do we have that? If you're, if you're looking for something and you've read it and then you can't find it, uh, here it is. Uh, our uh, Committee for Culture and Education, which is responsible for, for Erasmus, in their opinion, they have written the following words. We reiterate, we reiterate our support for the UK's continued participation in the Erasmus Plus program. We recall that participation in the program requires the UK to make a full and fair financial contribution. We call on the Commission not to accept piecemeal UK participation in Erasmus Plus or participation for a period shorter than the full length of the program under the multi-financial framework. We stress the importance of ensuring the requisite conditions for learning mobility under Erasmus Plus, both in the UK and the EU, including equal treatment for learners on an exchange, for example, with respect to tuition fees, easy access to core services, and the avoidance of unjustified financial or administrative burdens. That is the latest from the European Parliament, from our colleagues from the Culture Committee on Erasmus+. Plus. Thank you very much for that update. And I now like to invite Beatrice Wishart to ask her questions, followed by Annabel Ewing. Thank you, convener, and good morning, Mr McAllister. Um, I'd like to ask a bit more about uh, the fisheries negotiations, not least because I represent a fishing community. Um, and uh, you've already referred to the fact that you know there's been some movement after the third round of um, discussions. Um, I note that the chair of the European Parliament's Fisheries Commission, Committee had indicated that the UK's position could be self-sabotaging. Um, and uh, I just would like to have a bit more understanding about what a shift might be when Michel Barney has said that both sides are, um, could shift from maximalist positions on fisheries. Um, so what would be a minimalist position? Oh. Um, I, even though I come from uh, North Germany and I have the two major fishing ports in my district, uh, Bremerhaven and Cuxhaven, I, under, I am under no circumstances at all an expert on fisheries. Um, I only know that the fishing industry in Germany tells me that we need to get a fisheries deal done. And the best would be that everything remains as it is, but that might be uh, too much to expect. Now, our fisheries committee, as you have pointed out, is led by a French colleague, a French liberal. Um, if you look at the composition of the fisheries, Committee, no surprise, there are many French colleagues, Spanish colleagues, our Dutch friends, the Danish, uh, the Portuguese, and um, they are, of course, heavily interested in this. The Fisheries Committee has also sent us an opinion, and that is, well, it's very straightforward. Um, they say, but 
This is just now the opinion of the Fisheries Committee. That doesn't necessarily mean that this will be the meaning of the, the opinion of the European Parliament, but this is what we're working on as a in the moment on the, work, the working document. The Fisheries Committee says that it can be no comprehensive agreement. Well, no comprehensive agreement can be concluded between the EU and the UK if it doesn't include a complete, balanced and long-term fisheries agreement, allowing the continuation under optimal conditions of access to waters, resources and markets of the parties concerned. Then it says, The greatest mutual benefit will be obtained by maintaining reciprocal access to water and resources by defining common, coherent and stable principles and rules, enabling open access of fishing and aquaculture products to markets without causing economic or social tensions through unbalanced competition. And the other things are all very uh, technical. And finally, the provisions of any fisheries agreement should be supported by dispute settlement mechanisms as part of the general management of the governance of the future relationship between the EU and the UK. So this indicates a clearly expressed will here in the European Parliament that the fisheries agreement should be embedded in an overarching trade agreement and that there should always also be a governance structure for fisheries which is part of the general a governance structure. So that's all I can really uh, tell you uh, on the moment on um, what the UK, what the European Parliament has said um, on fisheries. I'm just getting another sheet of paper here. The agreement should be built on the principles of the common fisheries policy for the sustainable exploitation and conversation of marine living resources and for the social economic benefit of fishers, operators in the fishery sectors and consumers. Last sentence, it should be, it should offer a balanced, sustainable and long term arrangements. And it says here in an internal paper in the Parliament, it is positive that despite the delay in the publication of the UK's draft text on fisheries, the EU and the UK managed to achieve some progress on the negotiations on fisheries during the last negotiating round, bringing the two completely divergent positions closer to each other on five to six key areas. So that's some positive development, at least a starting point. Thank you. Beatrice. I was just going to say that may be positive to some, but I know that the common fisheries um, policy has been a source of uh, aggravation for our fishermen for, I know. Um, for decades. Um, so what actually might happen if uh, an agreement isn't reached on fisheries by the 1st of July? Well, um, what is the wording in the, in the withdrawal agreement? Uh, shall it shall use, use their best shall use for our best endeavors isn't that what but well let's try and use our best endeavors um if we don't make it to the first of july we will continue negotiating fisheries in the second half of this year at least okay uh, if, the, if the eu says that it should be part of the overall agreement then it has to be embedded in an overall agreement which we're still to negotiate but still, okay. let's use our best endeavours. And um, I know that fisheries is uh, a tricky issue in Scotland, but always bear in mind all the fish you catch, the delicious fish, you'll have to sell it somewhere. You, you, you can't eat all your fish on your own. I mean, you eat more fish and chips than we do in continental Europe, but. Um, access for delicious British fish to the single market, that's also an offer we have to make. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we much. found an agreement with the Norwegians. We found an agreement with the Norwegians. Perhaps we can find an agreement, I was about to say with the Scots, no with the British, yes. <laughs>
Let's hope so. Um, I'd like to invite Annabelle Ewing uh, to ask a question, followed by Stuart McMillan. Annabelle. Thank you, Kabira. Good morning, Ms McAllister. On the issue of fish, I would just say, of course, um, that sadly, over the many years of our membership of the EU, it is not the Scottish Government that has been conducting the negotiations directly. And if that had been the case, I think we would have seen over the many decades very, very different results. But turning to the issue of um, the extension of transition or not, um, I mean, taking into account the previous comments, for, for my part, I would agree entirely with Mr McAllister. I, I can't see how uh, uh, the, uh, the purpose of seeking an extension could really be questioned by any sane or rational person, because, of course, it reflects reality in terms of the length of time it takes normally to negotiate trade agreements. It reflects the fact that we are in the midst of a global pandemic uh, and, indeed, uh, to pile on economic pressure on business at this time is just nonsensical. A point made by the Financial Times board, editorial board uh, in a statement last week where they asked the UK government to give the UK economy a break by getting an extension. But uh, an interesting point was posed by Fabian Zulig and his team uh, of the European Policy Centre in a paper that they submitted to the committee this morning. I don't know if Mr McAllister has seen that where he posed the theoretical possibility, at least, of if the 1 July 2020 cut-off date passes with no extension agreed, would it be uh, legally or theoretically politically possible for there to be, nonetheless, an extension uh, agreed uh, in that period, 1 July 2020, to the end of the year? He talked about legally, well, you would need to uh, have a, a, a particular small treaty to do this. It would require unanimity in the Council. It would require, of course, EP consent. It would require to be ratified according to the national member state processes. And then, as to the substance of that, there could be issues politically. Does Mr. McAllister see that as at all uh, more than a kind of intellectual talking? Well, first of all, it's um, always great to hear and read that Fabian Suleg, who's a a German fellow citizen uh, is so well known in Scotland and, and respected, and uh, he, he has a tremendous knowledge of uh, Scottish politics. Um, really outstanding, and met him a couple of times, and it's always a pleasure uh, talking to him. I read in today's press cuttings uh, a Commission spokesperson was asked a similar question probably yesterday at the daily press conference about. Would this extension have to be agreed uh, by the 1st of July? And I think she gave a wise diplomatic uh, answer that it has been agreed in the withdrawal agreement that the Joint Committee may, before the 1st of July 2020, adopt the single decision, extend the transition period for up to one or two years and that this decision would have to be taken jointly by both sides. So that's the line to take in the moment. Could it be possible after the 1st of July? Well, that is a highly political question, which in the end, um, the heads of government and the British Prime Minister would have to agree. Um, we saw during the Brexit negotiations that certain dates were shifted. Um, if there's a will, there will be a way. But at the moment, it's not so much about the will here in Brussels or in the capitals of the member states. It's about a political a process uh, in the UK. However, having talked to UK negotiators and having followed so many public statements by the UK government, I would agree with Oliver Mundell that uh, we will just simply have to take note of a UK position not to agree to an extension of the transition period. There's nothing else we can do if there's not a change of mind. Uh, in 10 Downing Street, or to make things now even more complicated in the House of Commons. 
Thank you. Annabel. Okay. Um, well, I, and it's very much a wait and see. Sadly, the attention of the UK government at the moment seems very focused on a Downing Street special advisor and his eyesight uh, or otherwise. Um, another issue um, that uh, I, I think I, note hasn't yet been covered is the important issue of judicial cooperation. And I just wonder if Mr McAllister could just briefly indicate what the key stumbling block appears to be there, because this has been an area where, broadly speaking, the UK government, uh, through uh, the uh, – sorry, I'm getting a note from my computer that my battery is running low. Um, you know, previously, this had been an area where things tended to – to work quite well, even though it was uh, was it hard to with my ignorance. Um, and I just wonder what is the key stumbling block at the moment, Mr. McAllister, on that? Yes, as I mentioned, there are four main stumbling blocks: uh, governance, fisheries, level playing field, and internal security. Uh, here, I would say the following: with regard to law enforcement and judicial cooperation, the European Union has never previously offered such a close and broad security partnership with any third country outside the Schengen area. Uh, some British demands in this area go well beyond the well-precedented approach it declares to be taking. Uh, in particular, the UK seeks continued access to EU or Schengen databases. Such access is, however, linked to the obligations that member states have to comply with and would go beyond what some of them have today. These are also areas that, by their nature, require strong safeguards in terms of protection of fundamental rights. We need the UK to provide those guarantees, as agreed only seven months ago in the political declaration, such as adequate data protection standards. So this is um, rather technical. Um, I know that there is an ongoing debate just in these days in Brussels about further British participation in the Schengen information system. And the problem is that the UK, unfortunately, is a third country, but we both are very interested in having the closest possible cooperation. But uh, if you want to have access to the database, you need to follow the rules which apply to all other countries participating. So I think that's where we're standing at the moment. Uh, these are very technical issues. Um, I still believe that with goodwill on both sides, they can be solved. Let me just add one point. Since I chair the Foreign Affairs Committee in the European Parliament, it's regrettable that the UK has until now shown no interest at all to negotiate any kind of cooperation on foreign affairs, external security and defence. This was a major part of our um, uh, draft for the uh, future cooperation, and it's not even part of one of the 11 negotiation tables, which have been established. So that's something where we're disappointed, but perhaps we're still hoping for a British response at a later stage. And I think that also the EU has something to offer for the British side when it comes to cooperation on foreign affairs, security and defence. Thank you very much. I'd like to invite Stuart McMillan to ask his questions, followed by Gordon Lindhurst. Thank you, convener, and uh, good morning, Mr. McAllister. Um, I'd like to take you back to the, the questions that, uh, that Ross Greer asked earlier regarding Erasmus. I am someone who has studied in France, Germany, and also in Sweden, uh, so I fully understand and appreciate how important uh, the Erasmus scheme it was at the time. It was Erasmus Socrates I was involved in, and also European Social Fund. Uh, and in terms of the a future relationship you know, between the, the Scottish Government and the European Union, and also this Scottish Parliament and the EU institution, how, what recommendation or, or how would you, um, what suggestions would you put forward to, uh, to Scotland to try to um, engage even more so 
uh, with Europe to ensure that the, the dialogue between Scotland and Europe continues. If you talk to Brexit and all the consequences to constituents in my home region of North Germany, the question most citizens will ask is actually about future cooperation in Erasmus Plus, because so many young Germans are so keen to spend some of their studies uh, at the great universities um, your country has. So we all consider the UK being a crucial partner in the field of education, cultural youth and language learning, and a British continued participation in the Erasmus Plus programme would be a clear value and beneficial for the other 27 EU countries. As I just underlined, there's a simple fact. A continued British participation in Erasmus Plus must respect all relevant rules and conditions of participation as laid down in the programme regulation, and the UK cannot enjoy any decision-making power with respect to the programme. So therefore, for the EU, UK's demands that it will consider participation in elements of Erasmus Plus on a time-limited basis are not acceptable. So what can you do? Uh, since we're, we can only negotiate the participation of the sovereign countries in the uh, Erasmus Plus programme, I would lobby for the UK to understand that participating in Erasmus Plus is highly beneficial for the UK. Um, I mean, more students from the EU27 are going to English, Welsh, Scottish and Northern Irish universities and the other way around. But I must say that uh, fascinating to meet a Scot who, who studied in three different EU countries, including Germany. I would be keen to know which university you stayed in Germany and I hope you enjoyed it and that the Germans treated you in a decent way. Well, they certainly did. It was the, the Fachhochschule in Dortmund. And it was oh, my wife's uh, from Dortmund. Okay, it was a wonderful opportunity and uh, a great experience. It also helped that, uh, that BFOB won the, champ the Bundesliga uh, that particular year, year as well. So. Uh, but my, well, my second... Is, tonight, Stuart, just one point. Tonight is the important match by a Munich against Borussia Dortmund. And I, I, I have read in our newspapers that German football has now more interest in the UK because we've started this experiment of con continuing our football season uh, despite the uh, corona pandemic. So, tonight it's the big match. I'm, aware that I'm also aware that the convener will probably get me into trouble if I continue talking about football. Um, but um, uh, my second question is, is uh, you mentioned COVID there, uh, and the, uh, I, I know how challenging COVID has been to my constituents. My constituency uh, in the west of Scotland uh, has got, it's got many challenges, as across Europe uh, there are many areas where there are challenges. Uh, and the leaving the European Union, that decision has already been taken, but the, the opportunity for an extension because of the, the COVID pandemic uh, is something that is, that is there for, uh, for all sides in this particular debate. Uh, uh, I genuinely believe that uh, if we want to try to protect our constituents as best we possibly can uh, when, the, when the UK sadly leaves the European Union, an extension is, is that wonderful opportunity in terms of the, the potential economic depression that has been, that has been spoken about, the, the social challenges, that, uh, and uh, you, you spoke earlier regarding the, the level playing field, regarding the food, employment and also environment. Uh, if there is one key message that you would put to, uh, to both sides in this debate today, what would that be? The key message would be 
prepare the next round of negotiations at the beginning of June thoroughly. Let's see real tangible progress, breakthrough, which will then lead to a high level conference, middle of the end of June, and this can then pave the way to finalize the negotiations in the second half. So it's real tangible progress and let's not extend further letters. Let's talk to each other. That would be my message. Um, Thank you. And because you mentioned the, the corona pandemic, our German health secretary just sent me this morning an article he published uh, in an American or British news outlet. And it finishes with, like most crises, this one offers also opportunities. In many areas, it has brought out the best in us, a new sense of community, a greater willingness to help others, and renewed flexibility and creativity. Perhaps we need to be even more flexible and creative also in negotiating our future relations in these incredibly tough times of the pandemic. And by the way, I know at least from Germany, Every night on the German evening news, there are reports about the situation in the UK, and there's so much sympathy and solidarity in Germany with our friends in the UK, and the UK government knows that the one thing is to leave the EU, but uh, you have friends in Europe, you have partners in Europe, and we will always be ready to give you any kind of support in fighting these devastating consequences. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you very much. Um, now I invite Gordon Lindhurst to ask his questions, followed by Kenneth Gibson. Gordon. Thank you, convener, and uh, thank you, Mr. McAllister, for coming in, or well, for coming to. Uh, agreeing to speak to the committee today. Um, may I say, like Stuart, I also studied at a German university, and uh, both I and my fellow students from many European countries were very well treated and enjoyed the experience very much. So um, th that was uh, a well worthwhile uh, experience. And I want to um, ask, moving on from, uh, well, perhaps building on what uh, my colleague Stuart has asked, and this is about uh, relationships moving forward beyond December of this year after the UK has left the European Union. Um, I was on a, a delegation from the Scottish Parliament led by the presiding officer to Lower Saxony last June. Um, and uh, I know the, the, the convener as well has been on a, a, a trip looking to uh, encourage and establish mutual relationships with Germany and others have visited uh, different European countries. So what would you say about how we can develop uh, mutual relationships, trading relationships, cultural relationships, and how can we encourage these between Scotland and European nations and, and indeed uh, the whole of the UK and European nations beyond the stage at which uh, we get beyond this this uh, situation we've been discussing here. Well, great to hear that you are a member of the delegation which went to Lower Saxony. That's my home region. Uh, we still live with our family in Lower Saxony and have the honour of being the equivalent of a First Minister uh, in Leader Saxon from 2010 to 2013. Uh, and it's a great idea uh, to have a closer cooperation between Niedersachs and Scotland. I should have had the idea 10 years ago, uh, but I remember that uh, the then First Minister, Alex Salmond, came to a, an official visit to Niedersachs. Um, Scotland is so attractive um, for continental Europeans especially when it comes to your excellent universities uh, and the education system, the high-tech companies, um, 
for small and medium sized businesses focusing on real high tech areas, tourism, of course, uh, your exports. What you can do is reach out, organize bilateral relations with other regions in Europe. Uh, I know that the Ministry of as it could, what's English translation of um, science, research, and universities in Ida uh, The minister has agreed close cooperation between universities in Ida Saxon, Göttingen, Hanover, Brunswick, and Scottish universities. Uh, that's what I would definitely encourage you to continue to knit networks. Uh, uh, across the whole of Europe, and I also very much welcome the new activities in the Scottish Government and especially in the Scottish Parliament to also have closer cooperation with other regions uh, in Europe. And um, I would also say don't only go for the most obvious countries like Germany, France, Spain, Italy. I think there's also an incredible potential uh, in Eastern and Southeastern Europe, which still has to be raised. Um, so that's all I can really say. Um, be active and also utter a Scottish voice in Brussels or in Berlin. Um, I think the Scottish Government is very active here in Brussels. Uh, they do a lot of interesting events. Scotland House reaches out on a regular basis uh, to those MEPs who have links to Scotland who are interested in, in Scotland. And you don't have MEPs at the moment, but there are MEPs in this parliament, including David McAllister, who are interested in supporting you wherever we can. Um, we really miss the Scottish voices in Brussels, and this applies to all six Scottish MEPs we had to say farewell to on the 1st of, 1st of January across party lines. And I will never forget when the First Minister uh, visited Brussels, she invited all the Scottish MEPs for tea, and there were six and a half invited. I was the additional half MEP. And unfortunately, the representative of the UK Independence Party didn't appear, so I was able to sit at the real table, and I don't think anyone really missed him. <laughs> Gordon Lindhurst. Sorry for being political once, but uh, um, <clears throat> we miss our colleagues from the Conservatives, the Labour, the SNP, the Lib Dems, the Greens. We miss them all, but we don't miss the representatives of the other political groups. Well, that's, we that's a very, um, very, sorry, that's a, that's a very um, <laughs> effusive uh, uh, comment from a half MEP who uh, became a fully MEP from what you say uh, due to the absence of another MEP. <laughs> but I think, I think, um, I, think uh, it, I think what people in Scotland want to hear is that there's a willingness and interest and commitment to positive, constructive and mutually beneficial relationships, uh, both in trade, culture and education, that go beyond uh, December of this year. Because, uh, and I think uh, you've been political and too can play at that game, but I think the over a million Scots who voted to leave the European Union have heard an awful lot of negativity from the EU and from those who didn't want to accept the decision of the British peoples to leave the European Union. So I think it's important that we actually also start to look beyond this point to how we can build these constructive uh, and mutually beneficial relationships beyond it December 2020. You're absolutely right. Please um, apologise my sarcastic remark. Uh, and that was kind of the German humour, um, but I think you understood what I meant. Um, look, my party leader and chancellor is Angela Merkel, so it's always I'm always safe to quote the chancellor. And the chancellor, I remember, gave 
a government declaration in the German Bundestag a few hours or a few days after the results of the Brexit referendum were made public. And I remember her saying in the German Bundestag, after of course underlining that she deeply regrets this decision and that she's very sad and so on, she said in German, and perhaps you still understand the German phrase, es gibt keinen Grund garstig zu sein, which is more or less translated in English, there's no reason to be nasty. And this is a line we have taken in the Member States, in the Commission, in the European Parliament, despite so many of us being so upset. And if you believe it or not, I saw many colleagues in Brussels cry on the 31st of January, cry because we were so sad to see your great country leave our family of nations. We also always made clear it's done. They're gone. Who knows if they might come back someday, but it won't be soon, that's for sure. And let's try and work on the closest possible relationship the European Union can have with a third country. A third country which voluntarily is not only leaving the EU, but also wants to leave the single market and the customs union. So the closest possible partnership is what we're trying to achieve. And I mean, you can criticize the European Commission and Michel Barnier for many things, but you cannot criticize Michel Barnier and his team for offering a very ambitious, wide ranging proposal uh, for an agreement. Uh, so, from our side, there is really a lot of goodwill. The one thing the UK needs to understand is the integrity of the single market needs to be protected at all times. There cannot be any shortcomings here. Thank and you we're very still much. NATO allies. We're still NATO allies, we're neighbours and we remain friends. Thank you very much, and um, you're certainly a good friend of this committee. Um, I um, would like to invite Kenneth Gibson to ask his question, and Kenneth is the one in the NSP um, to ask questions. Hey, thank you, convener, and uh, good morning, Mr McAllister. We met before when I was uh, Chair of Finance Committee, and you were um, Minister President of Lower Saxony. Um, well, earlier today, in response to the Deputy Convener, you talked about avoiding a cliff edge when transition ends. And I think the key for most members of the public would be that in the wave of um, COVID-19 and the economic dislocation that's caused, has there been any assessment being undertaken by the European Union of the economic impact in terms of jobs, investment and growth? Uh, on the European Union and indeed the UK if we leave uh, on the 31st of December, uh, the transition period, without a deal? Um, this is my Brexit part two file with all the documents. Um, there has been an assessment on the economic consequences uh, for both cases, with a withdrawal agreement and without a withdrawal agreement. But I'm afraid that will, would take me a few minutes now to find this. Ken, if, if, you're, if it's okay for you, can you send me an email uh, to uh, www.mcallister.de? That's my homepage, and then you'll be. It can be forwarded to my internet to my email address, and I'll send you this in writing. If that's okay for you? Yes, that would be good because I think ultimately people want to know what it's going to mean for them and their communities. Ultimately, um, I'll, I'll move on then for my second question. Uh, I would like to quote um, uh, Professor Christopher Gray, who gave written evidence to the committee this morning. I don't know if you've actually seen that, but I'll just quote what he said briefly. He said, and I quote. 
The statements and reports following the third most recent round of negotiations, which concluded on 15 May 2020, suggest that the two sides are, if anything, diverging rather than converging. There are a huge number of uncertainties, so prediction is difficult, but my current judgment is that there is more likely than not that the UK will leave without a trade agreement in the sense of fully fledged uh, free trade agreement. Do you believe that the UK actually wants a deal? Oh, I can't answer this question. Um, I am not a member of the UK government. I'm not the spokesperson of the UK government. Um, that's something. Go on, go on. What was your instinct <laughs> as a politician? Go on. Put it out there. Um, Don't be too diplomatic. One thing, one thing is clear after the disappointing second and third round. The European Union now has stepped up all preparations for both possible outcomes. The UK leaving the single market and the customs union without an agreement or on the basis which we still prefer uh, on a uh, partnership agreement. So we're stepping up uh, both preparations. If the UK decides that they're not interested in negotiating uh, an agreement on the conditions uh, we have suggested, then I think it would be fair for both sides that we will be informed timely, so we can then prepare the emergency legislation on both sides to avoid the cliff edge. Um, didn't you talk in your country about a, a managed no deal Brexit? I remember that term. That would then be uh, a managed exit of the single market or the customs union. But honestly, this would by far only be the second best option. Well, there are no good options anyhow in this game. They're all terrible options. But of all options, I still believe it would be best that we focus on priorities in the second half as and we try to get as much as possible done and perhaps we can agree then to negotiate further details after the 1st of January. But what we definitely need is an agreement on the basics and this by the way includes our demand for an overarching governance framework. Uh, something we haven't discussed yet this morning. Um, we don't believe that the British approach is the right one to have many, many specific agreements with many, many uh, detailed governance structures. We want one agreement covering as many issues as possible and, and especially uh, with an overarching governance uh, framework. And if I may just add one point, because I was in a conversation with Hilary Benn, uh, the chairman of the House of Commons Committee on, um, the, on the cooperation on the parliamentary side. Uh, where is that? Um, we are in favour uh, in the European Parliament, and it's also part of our draft that in the European Union draft that we would like to see an EU-UK parliamentary assembly being established uh, after the EU leaves the single market and the customs union, so we can also uh, keep parliamentarians on both sides involved. Those of you who know the European Parliament know that we have many of these kind of parliamentary assembly delegations with other countries in the Western Balkans and Eastern Europe, just to name a few. That would be interesting. Now, I know I've had my two questions, so I'll just say that uh, although you were uh, born in Germany and uh, educated in Berlin, I still think you've got a wee hint of a Scottish accent there. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, uh, I went to a British school in, in Berlin, British military school, for the first few years. Uh, but apart from that, I just spoke English at home with my father, who came from Glasgow. Um, oh, it's getting stronger uh, by the second. 
<laughs> I think that happens if you talk to people from Scotland. It's a bit like if you go to Germany and you, you speak to Bavarians. Uh, after, after a while, you start you know, getting it. But it's such a beautiful accent. Uh, you, it's, it's incredible. And uh, Scottish English is so popular among Germans. I don't think you Scots know how popular you are. I mean, nobody can really be, have anything against Scots. Um, so hopefully many, many German tourists will once again spend a lot of their money in your great country also this summer, despite all the this challenges. On, on, on that point, um, there is a European Parliament friendship group uh, in, on Scotland, um, which we're very pleased to see. I mean, how do you see our committee being able to assist that friendship group in maintaining relationships with the European Parliament? Well, the one thing is that, uh, that uh, friendship groups have been established here, but they are informal uh, uh, groupings of MPs. There's a f uh, the group Friends of the UK. There's also a group that's been established, Friends of Scotland. Uh, I usually don't join friendship groups, but I made one exception. I'm a member of the Friends of Scotland a group, uh, but of course we need some how can I put it, guidance and support uh, coming from Scotland House uh, to keep it going. Uh, the members of the Scotland Friendship Group here in the European Parliament are mainly the colleagues who either have family in Scotland or um, have studied in Scotland and many colleagues across the lines, across the party lines, have um, uh, studied in Scotland. Now, um, on the official cooperation in the EU draft text of the agreement on a new partnership with the UK, we suggest a parliamentary partnership assembly should be established. It shall be a forum for members of the European Parliament and the Parliament of the United Kingdom to meet and exchange views. It shall meet at intervals which it shall itself determine. It shall consist of MEPs and members of the House of, well, it says members of the Parliament of the United Kingdom. So we're not going into details if this also means the House of Lords. Um, it should be chaired in turn by a representative on the one side and the other side. And the Parliamentary Partnership Assembly shall be informed of the decisions and recommendations of the Partnership Council. So really what we want is to build another link another bridge also on the parliamentary side between uh, the UK Parliament and the European Parliament. Um, we, the European Parliament doesn't have parliamentary relations officially with uh, non-sovereign um, regions and countries, as you know. Um, although the European Parliament continues to have an office in Edinburgh and uh, cooperates uh, very constructively with the Scottish Parliament, so it would be good to see a role for the Scottish Parliament and for this committee in terms of our engagement with the European Parliament going forward, whatever happens. Um, can I uh, thank you, you very come, much? Honourable yes. Convener, if you come to Brussels with your colleagues, you are always welcome, and if I count the numbers, you might just all fit in my office, and I would be happy to serve you a cup of Belgian coffee and chocolate. My door is always open to all Scottish politicians from whatever party they come from, with one exception. Thank you very much. That's a very tempting offer, and it might even be worth uh, putting up with quarantine uh, for that invitation. So thank you very much, and we very much hope we'll be able to take it up uh, in future. Um, and thank you very much for coming to give evidence today uh, to our committee, uh, David. Um, the committee will continue our scrutiny of the future relationship negotiations next week when we will take evidence from Philip Rycroft, the former permanent secretary at the UK Government Department for exiting the European Union. And the date and time of the meeting will be confirmed as soon as possible. Uh, I'd like to thank David again and conclude the public part of this morning's meeting. And I now move into private session. Thank you very much.